Um, everybody knows what the as is contract is and what and what it says about inspection and the conditions of properties, right? Because that's what we're going to talk about today is what the sellers have to disclose versus what the buyers can discover and what they can ask and all of that. So what I wanted to do, since everybody knows the as is, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll look at that really quickly. Um, I'm going to try, and I'm not sure how this is going to work. So I'm going to try to, if I share my screen, is that is that what I have to do, Joanna? I hit yes, ma'am. Yeah. Click the green okay. share screen button. And then right. it'll, you'll just click the OK. So I hit share. Yeah. No. And you are you set. Okay. Okay. Well, you did let's, it see right. what, let's see what we can do. All right. So I've got, so I do have, I do have contracts up in here. I did it in a, I did a test file just for fun. So everybody knows the as is, right? That there's, and I'll slide it right down that there's, that there's 15 days to inspect. The as is allows anybody uncle john the buyer anybody to just walk through the house and take a look at it it's basically a 15-day free look the buyer can cancel for any reason it doesn't have to be anything structural it doesn't have to be termites it can just be oh i decided i didn't like the green paint on the walls they can just back out for any reason whatsoever that that does not exclude the seller it does not excuse him from having to disclose anything that he knows is wrong with the property that's that's one reason that we use and i'm going to use, you can also see on the screen the seller's property disclosure statement florida law says they have to disclose our policy wants our sellers to put it in writing it's a better protection for both you and the seller and the the thing is it's not readily things that are not readily seen you know you wouldn't know if there's termites behind the wall normally unless you had a test done um but would you you would know if your um plumbing was leaking under the kitchen sink so those so those are the kind of things that you have to look at when you're talking with the seller um so the first thing you're going to do when you write a contract look in the mls see if there is a seller's property disclosure statement attached um to any of the mls's and see if that's there so you can provide that to the buyer. That can help you make a decision as to how you want to start your negotiations with the contract. For the last 10 years, we've been using the, the as is um, because it's easier and it allows the buyer to get out. Um, in this marketplace, I don't know if you really want the buyers to get out of these things easier, but it, again, it, it depends on the buyer. You can also take a look when you're looking through the house, just just that overall um, visual inspection. Do you think there's going to be a lot of hidden things in there? If there are going to be a lot of hidden things in there and, and the customer is maybe on a limited budget, you know, and they're not going to have thousands of dollars to fix things, um, you might want to suggest to the customer, since you love the house and I know, you know, that you're concerned about the costs and that kind of stuff, what if we use a standard contract? I don't know how many of you guys have written the residential contract in, for sale and purchase in a while. Has anybody been using it? Are we sticking mostly with the with the as is? As is, yeah. Okay, so I wanted to take a couple of minutes and, and go through this. I'm only gonna focus on page five. So if you're following along or if you have access to, to the contracts, this is really good. At the bottom of page five, that's where all this stuff starts property maintenance condition inspections etc so and i'm old so i have to put my glasses on so the property inspection on line 2 260 property inspection and repair paragraph 12. the it's the same wording as the as is buyer shall have blank if blank days and it's 15 days after effective date that is now called our inspection period then the buyer can have anything he wants done General inspections, WDO, permit inspections, also doing due diligence um, to go ahead and check it. If they don't do it, then obviously they've just they've just waived any kind of obligation, and it says it right in there. Then the seller's not going to be required to fix really anything from that from that aspect. The buyer also agrees. If you look on line two sixty six, that. Any of their inspections, it, say they cut out a piece of drywall to look inside the wall, the buyer agrees that they will re, they will repair that. They'll fix it back to its pre-inspection condition because they don't own the property. The seller still does, right? 
So it goes into general property inspection and repair. That's what we're talking about when you call when you call the home team or pillar to post or any of your guys that carry E and L and liability insurance. Make sure your homeowners, your home inspector has both liability and E and O to cover both of you in case they do something incorrect. All right. So all of all of these things, the seller is obligated to repair or replace. This is, they have to have it inspected. But if you look on line 72, it has to be by a person who holds an occupational license to conduct home inspections or who holds a Florida license to repair and maintain items inspected. That would be a professional inspection company. You cannot use Uncle's, Uncle Joe to do this. This time, the level is up there. It's, it's higher because there's no getting out of it, if you will, right? So it talks about about informing it. They have buyer shell within the inspection period, that's line 273, 274, they have to inform the seller. Now, when we talk about informing the seller, that is not a text, that is not an email, that is not a phone call. You can start with that, but make sure you put it in writing. It can be an addendum, it can be a simple Word document that says, these are the items that we found. I would reference the home inspection report, you know, see page five for the plumbing and all of that, so that it's real clear as to what the buyer is requesting the seller to fix up. The whole part of that, the whole meat, and this is where it all changes, and that's why there's a whole other page to the residential contract, is on page six. And that starts with, with property condition. The following items, and it's very clear, and it's very specific, and most of us don't read this whole thing, right? So it's gotta be free of leaks, water damage, um, like I'm looking at the ceiling, the roof, they include the fascia, they include the soffit. So this is very specific to the customer. He understands exactly what the seller is gonna be obligated to fix and the seller will be obligated to, to know as well. Exterior, interior walls, walls, not paint. Doors, windows, foundation. It talks about on line 279, the pool, the pool equipment, any non-leased major appliances, so now we've got the range, the refrigerator, Didn't all of that is now going to be included in the in what the seller has to is saying is in good and working order. Heating, cooling, mechanical, electrical, security, sprinkler, septic, plumbing. It has hit all the biggies. Now it talks about seawalls and the dock. Those are now considered structural parts of the property. It's not now, it's not talking about personal property. Um, a boat lift personal property, but the seawall and the dock are actually holding that property together. That's what's making that house stay where it should be, right? So it says they have to be in working condition and it has to be maintained until closing. What's interesting is 281, because everybody gets confused about this, pool screens, patio screens, is that structural or is it not? That's been a, that's been a big thing and they've changed in the contract years and years and years. This version says torn screens have to be fixed. So now you've got a pool cage with, with a rip on the top. That's a very expensive little piece of, of screen read, right? The seller has to fix it. Fogged windows and missing roof tiles or shingles shall be repaired or replaced. So think about that, missing roof tiles and shingles. Now from line 283 starts going into cosmetic conditions. Those are the things that the buyer could say in the as is, oh, I just don't care, I want out. On this contract, the buyer is going to be deeming to accept these things as part of the property. It's not, it's, it's unless the seller did something to cause it to be a defect, which, you know, like say they wanted to fix a, a plumbing leak and they just didn't fix it. They just didn't put the tile back on the wall. Okay, um, so working condition means operating in the manner in which it was designed to operate. So if you've got a ceiling fan that has three speeds, how many speeds does it have to have to be in working condition? Yay, three. That's exactly right. It's amazing though, what, what happens. Now, if that ceiling fan only has two things and the seller put it in the property disclosure statement, then you know that it's there and you're, and you're not gonna, and, the seller won't be obligated to fix it. So we've got aesthetic imperfections. That's on line 286, right? So pitted bar site on a pool. The pool can be used. It's just ugly. Tears, worn spots, you know, if the flooring is, is crapped out, okay, but the house still works. 
you know, you may have ripped, 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 ripped linoleum, okay? Doesn't affect the structural integrity of the house. That's what you're looking at and everything that the customer is asking for. If the wallpaper's coming down or if the window treatments are just falling apart, doesn't affect the structural integrity of the house. A nail hole from a picture, you know, a, a, a scrape in the walls, dents, chips, caulking, that kind of stuff. That's considered cosmetic. And I'm going to kind of veer off a little bit. Sometimes if there's a big scrape in the wall or a big dent in the wall, VA or FHA inspectors may consider that a structural thing. Yes, Jean. I have a question about the caulking. Um, mm -hmm. Does that include like in an older bathroom where the caulking uh, around the tub surround has like little black spots? Like I know that you've got to replace it every so and so and offer. But that doesn't that that's not something that the seller's got to go. Oh, I've got to fix that according to this contract. Right, that's co that's okay. cosmetic. Right. Okay, thanks, thanks. What would affect if like if they tapped it and they found that there was wet drywall behind the tile? It might have been caused by the caulking coming down, but now the part that the seller has to address is that is that mushed out drywall because now the shower area isn't working the way it was designed to work. Make does got that make it. sense? Okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So, um, so, okay. And then continue on to page two on 288 mirrors. You know, you might have some little deterioration on the corners of the mirrors. Doesn't affect the structural integrity of the house. Um, minor cracks in walls, floor tiles, windows, little cracks, not big cracks, driveways, sidewalks. Again, little crack versus large crack. That's why you have um, a, an engineer or a home inspector go through and say, oh, that's a, that's a settlement crack as opposed to um, the foundation of the house is coming up, right? So, so look at that, what minor, you know, what minor is. Pool decks, if there's cracking in the pool decks, that's considered cosmetic according to the contract. And again, if you get a VA or an FHA inspector, they may very well require that some of those little spidery cracks um, going towards the edge of the pool might have to be fixed. Justin, my son just bought a house like that. And they were just small little cracks. They were just ugly, um, but it wasn't affecting the structural integrity of the pool, the capping of the, on the pool or anything. But VA said, oh no, Mr. Seller, you've got to fix these, these five little spider cracks. So keep in mind when you're talking to your customer, you know, what, what a lender might require versus, you know, and the appraiser might require, and then what the seller is going to be obligated to under the contract. Are we feeling like we're kind of getting overwhelmed when you just look at 10 lines in a, in a pair, in a contract? <laughs> this is, this is really huge meat in the contract with it. And you've got to know that you don't have to have this memorized because you're going to forget something, but know where it is, be able to blow that up, discuss it with your customers. Cause now we're talking, we talked pool decks, garage, patio floors, and the big important thing for the roof, again, now we've got inspections and appraisals and lenders and all of that, but crack roof tiles, are, are cosmetic. They are not structural. They just look yucky. They don't affect the structural integrity of the roof. Curling or worn shingles or even limited roof life, according to the contract that we're using, is not considered structural. They're not defects. So the seller is not obligated to fix that. If a shingle's missing, yes. But just an ugly looking one or a curled up one indicating it might be running, it might be getting near at the end of its life. The seller is under no legal obligation under the contract to fix it. Now you get an, it could be an insurance issue. It could be an FHA or a VA appraisal issue as well. But those things don't apply within this paragraph. So when you're writing your offers, you have to keep all of those things in mind as to whether you're going to use an as is, whether you're going to use the general. Um, and you may need to point out to the um, listing agent, if you're on the buying side, that there are some of these things that while they're considered cosmetic in the contract, they're going to have to be fixed. You may want to seriously consider writing that in um, on, the gen on the additional terms and conditions on page 12 on this contract, um, saying, you know, the seller to fix this and that. In, in case you're worried about it, because this isn't uh, this isn't making you not it doesn't. I'm, let me rephrase that. It does allow you to still make those that make those choices because the buyer may see something in the house that he thinks needs to be repaired, even if it's not structural. 
like this, like a ceiling fan hanging down, or maybe the, or maybe the, the Bahama shutters aren't quite the way that he would want them. You can write those in additional terms and conditions. It's everything's, everything's always negotiable. Just keep in mind, this is, this is your framework for what the seller is legally obligated to do without, without any kind of negotiation or fighting. Um, then it goes on to what the buyer actually has to do, right? They all, they, they're obligated to make them as necessary to bring them up to the condition that they're in. So if you have a, a 10 year old air conditioner that's not working, the seller technically doesn't have to replace it with a brand new air conditioner. Um, we generally don't say that we don't promote that, but long as it's working and it, and it fits, that's, that's absolutely fine. According to the contract. Um, it also puts some time frames in here in this paragraph. Um, if you look on line 294 about when you have to report this, okay, you have 15 days for the inspection. The seller has 10 days after the receipt of the buyer's notice or, or, the, or the inspection report to have those repairs estimated. They don't have to have them done within 10 days, but they have to address it and figure out what it's gonna cost them. And then they deliver it to the buyer and say, here's what it's gonna cost us, and this is what we're gonna fix. Or if they totally disagree with it, uh, they, the, the seller can pay for a second inspection and have a whole home inspection done, provide a copy of, of the report and estimates to the buyer. So now you've got some disagreements, right? The contract helps us out with this too. So you can always fall back onto, here's, here's what the Florida Realtors and the Florida Florida Bar has come up with for us. So it gives us something to do and takes us off the hook. So on line 297, if buyers and sellers inspection reports differ, way far apart, and the buyers um, can't negotiate that out, which is where you and the listing agent are gonna come in. You try to, try to hash that out. If they can't, then the buyer and the seller can choose a third inspection and they will share the cost of that third inspection. That report will be binding. So whatever that third report says is what everybody agrees to. Um, I've never had to go through all of that part. I, we, we usually end up coming up with some kind of negotiations after the, after the first report. But if you've got something that's really dramatic, then you know perhaps your seller, if you're on the listing side, you might want to suggest to the seller, go ahead and pay the $500 for a second inspection and then and then kind of go from there. Do they do anything like that in Illinois, Steve? You're muted. You want to unmute yourself? Yeah, I'm going to ask you to unmute. There you go. There you go. Um, no, actually, I, I haven't experienced that, but I know it's all and it ends up in negotiation point. Yeah, that's yeah, that's, that's really it. We're, you know, our, that's our main skill. We're not salespeople. We're negotiators. Um, yeah. And by the way, if anybody's going to Florida Realtors in August, um, there is a designation it's called R.E.N.E. -E. It's a full negotiation expert um, designation. And the class is one day. It's absolutely fantastic. It's um, May 23rd. I think it's a full day up, up in Orlando. It's really worth taking. Um, I, and if you're not going to do it in Orlando, watch for it somewhere else. Cause it's really good. It gives you some really good things and it relates directly to what we're doing, you know, in the contracts. Okay. Here's the biggie stuff line 300. And this is where, you know, what, are they, what are they supposed to do? We already did that. Okay, never mind. Okay, wood destroying organisms, inspection and repair. The property may be respect, may be inspected by a Florida licensed pest control, WDO inspector, right? Again, not Uncle Sam. It, your lenders, most of your lenders are requiring WDOs, um, otherwise known as termite reports. Some, in, some lenders lately have said they don't care. It's Florida. We have all kinds of termites. I would always, always, always encourage your customer to have one done. Um, we recently had one. The south, the buyer said, "Well, it's a it's a concrete block house. I don't need to have term. I, I don't need to have a termite inspection." I'm like, "Holy crap!" You know, you try like you're, like crazy to have it to to get them to do it. If they don't do it and they don't want to do it, please get some documentation from them to CYA. That could be an email from them. There, there's some waiver inspection reports we have in app files as well. You, you know, get off the hook with that one. 
because there can be termites. There can be wood destroying organisms. And that's line 314. It's not just termites, it's powder post beetles, old house borers, wood decaying fungi. What is fungi? Mold. <laughs> that that damages or infests seasoned wood in structures excluding the fences fha va they don't even care about the fences unless it touches the house you know then you might have then then you might have some issues so when you're listing the property look at those fences if it looks like there might be any kind of wood destroying whatever suggest to the seller they tear the fence down or they fix it um, look at the wood trimming that's usually around a garage door where there's been water damage. That's that's an area that usually has wood decaying fungi in it, and the inspectors are, are going to note that. So you could have a lot more of those kind of issues than you will termites. Um, but keep that in mind. It uh, This whole next paragraph, and I'm really not going to go into a lot of that because we don't have too much of it very often, but if the sellers treated it and they've disclosed that they've treated for wood destroying organisms, there, there's remedies for what can be done in there as far as transferring warranties, all of that kind of stuff. If there's no visible infestation on a property that's been treated, you can't ask the seller to fix stuff. Just be very, very careful. Questions on, on, on wood destroying organisms so far? JJ, this is Tim. Um, yeah. Just a kind of a general question regarding you know, you, you do the contract and, you know, you, you set a close date, inspection happens, they find something in this order, whatever it might be. Um, mm -hmm. And within, say, 10 days, you know, somebody finds that uh, here's the estimate, here's what it's going to take. Now you start going outside the bounds of that close date. Assumption is uh, if everyone still wants to move forward, an addendum goes out changing the close date. I mean, I'm just kind of Assuming yeah, then you would just do an addendum anytime you have yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. And that's part of like the negotiation too. You can negotiate putting money in escrow to get things finished. Right. Okay. To to move forward, especially if there's a lend if there's a lender involved, the lender doesn't want to extend the closing. Right. So so you can do things like that. Um, and uh, can I there, say there are, about go lenders? Ahead. Lenders, some lenders will allow you to escrow and some won't. So you're going to have to have communications with the. Um, lending officer right absolutely and some title companies don't like holding things after closing either we um we do have a trust account if we have to do it worst case scenario jones and company can put it in the trust account the last thing we want to do is having a deal fall apart because of that there are there are limits we've talked about what the seller has to do but there are limit there are limits to it doesn't it doesn't give the buyer a blank check to ask the sellers to do that um on page three there's closing costs on the standard contract, this is where it looks different than the as is as well. This is where it lays out the percentages. And it says right on line 135, sellers shall pay the following amounts for general repair items. And, in, and you can put an amount or a percentage, or if you leave it blank, the state has already said it's one and a half percent structural. So if the house is $100,000, we've got $1,500 for general repair items. If you're walking through the house and you looks like there might be something bigger that you're anticipating, you can always put a larger amount in there. The one and a half also applies for wood destroying organism treatment and repair. So you've got 1% structural, 1% wood destroying organisms, and, and I didn't go through that in the contract in the interest of time, but if there's open permits or expired building permits, or there, or perhaps somebody added a bathroom without a permit. No, they would never do that, right? If 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 the lender says, "Oh, there's this bathroom," well, you need to have it permitted out. The contract allows for one and a half percent of taking care of all these of all of these building permits. So the seller has a lot of obligation to do all those kinds of things. So your obligation when you're listing it is to really dig deep and make sure that um, the seller did everything with permits or advise them that this could potentially come up right. or be ready to negotiate when you get the offer. Uh, so if you're on the buying side, you're looking at that one and a half, you're looking at the one and a half for, for, wood, for wood destroying, and then you're looking at one and a half for open permits. That does not mean you can combine them together. Because some people will go, oh, it's only $500 worth of structural stuff, but the termite 
might end up costing 2%, right? You can't automatically just lump it together and say, oh, we've got 3% to futz around with. Make sure all the parties under, understand that because that's, that's gonna be the biggest key to your negotiation. And when you were talking about escrowing monies and if the things weren't done, Tim, th there's also a little bit more in that too. On line 143, right. if they're not able to get it done, there's a cap on, and it automatically decides how much money is going to be put aside because usually the seller will say, oh, it's only $1,000 to finish the thing. I've got the bill. I've got the invoice. Well, that's fantastic, but we want to protect everybody. So the contract says automatically one sums equal to 125%. So if you've got a $1,000 invoice there, they're going to put $1,250 in escrow. Right. And, and because it's in the contract, you don't have to be the bad guy. Gotcha. It's, it's already there. JJ, one question. Actually, this contract is one that came up recently on one of my sales. And, and the one question they had was, it basically looks like you could have up to 4.5% total of the purchase price in repairs. Is that how I'm reading it too? It could be, but again, you've got to keep it in three separate segments. Right, right. And, mm -hmm. and that's that's where most people get confused because they, they see the 4.5% all of a sudden and they're going, holy crap. You know, mm -hmm. but again, it's only if, only yeah. if there's open permits, only if we find we're destroying organisms and things like that. And a lot of that cost can be controlled when you go to list it. That's why I said, watch, watch for those key things like the little rotten wood by the garage, you know, ask, ask them very carefully, lots of questions. You know, when was the last time you did this? Does everything work? That's why that seller's property disclosure is so important. Cause then you can say, go through each room, turn the ceiling fans on. Does it work with all three speeds? Does your window open and close properly? Mm -hmm. Does your doorknob operate correctly? You know, things that can, things that are structural, that's the stuff that, that you're looking for in there. Um, if you see a wood, you know, you're looking around through, as you're touring the house and you see a wet spot, you know, is it a, is it a stain? Is it an old one? Is it a, is it a fresh one? Um, we're not termite inspectors by any means, but we certainly can see rodent droppings or things that look like it could potentially be a spot for a termite. You know, again, don't, don't say, oh, I think that's termites, but oh, that's an area of concern. I think before we put the house on the market, Mr. Seller, we should find out what we're dealing with. And from a seller's perspective, can we um, can we specify saying that you know if someone presents this type of uh, offer that it's uh, not not advised because it puts them at a at a disadvantage or something? Yeah, you are when you're the listing agent, you're you're in total control of that, and that's why you'll see in the confidential remarks a lot of times it'll say please use okay. as is contract. Okay. Um, you could also say, you know, please use general contract. We've seen a couple of those sometimes where the seller feels so confident in their property that they don't want the buyer to use the as is. They don't want them to have that free look. They're going to stand right there behind the property. Okay. Um, but the but the seller drives the decision. Okay. So so you would just you would just have those kind of discussions. Jean, could I ask a question about dead looking pools? Um, dead looking pools yeah like the the pool is green okay we've seen it we've seen it we saw it years ago in in the in the dark days but now i mean um some of the people that i i think are going to come to market um now that the unemployment's run out and now that the uh, time period for the escape on paying the mortgages um some of them haven't really been able to upkeep and so what do you do going in if you're the listing agent and you look at the pool and the customer says, I don't have the money to do it, other than disclosing that it is an as is, what, how can you handle that? Personally, it affects the value so much of the price, which affects your commission. Yeah, I know. It, I would be paying to get that pool shocked. And you could make a deal with the, you could make a deal with your seller, say, you know what, I'll put the money up front. I'll pay the $250 that needed to, to shock the pool um, and have them sign a little promissory note that at closing, they'll pay you back. That, yeah. that, that's one way to do it. If they truly have no money, sometimes you just do it and you eat it. You know, I look at the, the property, that's my product that I'm selling. Um, and I don't, I don't want to make less money because it looks terrible. 
It's like yeah. selling a used car. You want, you know, you go and you detail it and you wash it. Same, mm -hmm. same, the same thing with the house. Um, if it's, if it's not working and it's green because the pool pump's broken, that's a whole nother story. You know, yeah, that, that what, let's, let's talk about that story. Yeah. So if it, yeah, if it doesn't work, that's simply the seller simply has to disclose it, okay. that it isn't working. Um, yeah. I, you know, now, now when you get into the lenders and things like that, the buyer is going to be aware already that it isn't working. So they're going to have to, they're going to have to figure out if the lender is going to allow them to buy the house with a, with a broken pool pump, or if they'll give them certain days to get it all done, things like that. So that's where it comes down to negotiation because you may end up, um, you know, somebody may have to put the pool pump in prior to closing and the buyer may agree to pay the, pay the seller back outside of closing. We don't want to have anything to do with that. Yeah. You know, but yeah, you can, you can get creative in trying to get that, that kind of stuff done. Okay. I mean, sometimes I, I had a house listed one time. This couple was so, was so broke that they couldn't even afford to put additional light bulbs in their house, you know? So yes. uh, went to the store and bought a bunch of light bulbs and stuck them in again, because it's my product and it's my reputation. So I want it to have the, be the best face on it. So sometimes okay. we just have to do that. Okay. Thanks. I hope that helped a little bit. I mean, this is this is the biggest piece of of how we sell our property, but we have to know what's going on with it as far as maintenance requirements, what exactly is structural, what exactly is cosmetic, and that kind of thing. I like the general sale contract. I think, especially if you're, as our buyers are saying, we're overpaying, we're paying at the top of the market, and we want the house to be in great shape. I would, I would tend to present the offers with this contract first. And if the sellers really balk at it, that's, that to me sometimes is a warning symbol, you know, a little sign that um, maybe there's more stuff going on behind the walls, behind the doors that the seller doesn't want us to know about. This is one thing you really have to be careful of when you're working with for sale by owners too. You know, they don't really know what the law is about what they have to disclose, um, or they're really, you know, and they're sneaky. They they might know something, but they figure, oh, if I don't if I don't have it tested, then I don't have to disclose. Remember defective drywall? Everybody everybody kind of had an idea that the house probably had it, but if you didn't have the test, you don't have to disclose it. You know, you think you've got termites destroying your house up, but if you don't get a but if you don't have a termite report done, ah, no termites, you don't have to disclose. So you have to be really, really careful when you're dealing with unrepresented sellers, as we can call those for sale by owners. Um, and those are things you can use as effective tools to get a listing sometimes, you know, getting those sellers through that because they are oh, living this house. It's perfect. You know, OK, well, let's stand behind it. Let's look at, you know, let's look at this contract. It might help them get a higher price for their property, too. So I think that's kind of cool. Naples is a disaster in a half. That's all I'm going to say about the contract, because that takes it. That takes over an hour. I mean, I put it I put it in there and I can pull it up for you, but it is like it's the most ambiguous wording and it goes around in circles. So unless you have to use this contract, don't. I'm going to tell you because that's how you get into trouble. Like, you know, like we're covering this residential contract today so that you know that a torn screen on a pool cage is considered structural and has to be fixed. Um, you know, a curling roof shingle is cosmetic and doesn't have to be fixed. You need to know all that kind of stuff. The neighbor thing has got all kinds of weirdo stuff in here. Um, it's a good contract. It's just written by attorneys and just and it, it gets a little more weird. Like over here on line 101, right? They have a paragraph in here for an inspection waiver. It's saying seller buyer reserves the right to conduct the inspections or they can do all of these other things in here. They can waive it, they can reserve the right, they can they can do all of that. And that's how it, and that's how it starts. And then it just goes into pages and pages and pages of days of how many days you have to do the inspections and how many days the seller has to respond to it and what he'll fix and what he won't. So it gets into a lot of little time frames for negotiating back and forth with within the contract. So like I said, I'm not going to cover that. That's a whole, whole class in itself just to cover Naples. But again, if you're if you're even thinking about selling down in Naples, get that contract out and start reading it and compare it to the far bar, you know the far bar contracts better and keep you out of trouble. So try to use those as, as much as possible. That's about where I'm at with this. Um, I'm sure I'm sure lots of more questions.
Yeah, JJ, I do. I have a couple of questions, JJ. Um, one, like when we're in, I'm, I'm seeing in Lee County a lot where they have apparently Naples listing agents and they want us to use the NABOR. Do we have to use the NABOR when we're in Fort Myers? The seller drives what you have to do. Keep that in okay. mind. So, so the Naples seller may say that, and and the agent's probably encouraging them to do that because they know the Naples the Naples contract better. Um, I think I think in our library, and Joanna can tell me if we do. I I think we have um, something from Sam Sad that talks about the Naples contracts in there. Oh, I see the puppy. <laughs> oh, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, JJ. Um, on YouTube, Sam goes over the whole entire new Naples contract. So we've got that class up, and then we've got his breakdown in um, app files as well. Yeah. So, so that's what I would do. Take a take a look at that um, before you go out and sell it, and get and get used to it. Okay. And then I have one more question. Uh, I, when you're representing a, a buyer on the regular contract, do you would you automatically just put in the 1.5% or would you put a dollar value? I think it depends on the price point of the house. Because if you're selling a really inexpensive house, like 200 or $300,000, you know, your one and a half percent can be too, can be very small. And any, a, a termite, a termite um, infestation can just having a, a simple tenting can be $3,000. Okay. So you might need to add a dollar figure in something like that. You're going to determine that more as you walk through the house with the customer, because as you're showing the house, you might see that the air conditioner is like really super old and, and may, you know, may conk out. So okay. the day the day after, so you might want to include a, a dollar item. But keep in mind that's going to be part of the negotiation on the contract too. If the seller doesn't like what you're asking, they can counter back, back and right. forth. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Oh sure. I'm glad. Really? I'm glad. I'm glad yeah. I know we're engaged. <laughs> I have a really quick question about sure. non-refundable security deposits. What do you think about that after the home inspection is done? and additional monies put in and everything is non-refundable. For escrows, um, I, think that, I think that can be a very strong way to get your offer accepted if you're on the, if you're on the buying side. Um, a lot of that I see more on the as-is contracts. You know, they'll say, okay, we'll do, we'll take our 15 days, we'll do the inspection. Um, and then if we like it, then we'll put, then we'll put an additional $5,000 down and that can be a non-refundable deposit. It, it just, gives the seller added assurance that you're good, that you're in the game, but it also doesn't require the buyer to give it prior to the inspection. So the buyer still has an out within, within that amount of time. Right. I think we have to be very, very strong right now from buyers to get the, the properties that we want. I mean, I would rather do something like that than go into an offer with no inspection contingency, no this and that, which is what a lot of sellers are looking for. So I'd rather say, well, instead of my saying no, I will agree to pay you <laughs> if, uh, if I decide to go ahead and buy, you know, and then by being a non-refundable deposit, it still will be credited to them when they close. So I, I think it's kind of a win-win, but it all, you know, but the buyer has to really be in the game and want to buy that house, not just tire kicking and using, using us well, to I have write a, off their vacation. My seller wants to go that approach. He did want to do the no inspection stuff. And I said, oh, we can't do that. We have to let them inspect. I says, it's only to your best interest and you will be filling out a property disclosure as well, you know, because everything is original from 2006. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's vintage. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sell it that way, you know, and that's good if this, you know, especially with the older houses like that, maybe paying to have a home inspection done, mm -hmm. a pre-inspection done. And some of these inspectors will do a cursory inspection as opposed to a deep dive inspection. They'll do a visual kind of thing and give a statement. So it might only run them a couple hundred bucks for something like that. Um, that would be a really good thing. I, I think on an old, on an older home like that, yeah. um, because that will make your home stand out. That seems to be an issue with a lot of buyers. They're really concerned about the ages of the houses right now. I know it's so weird. I'm from New England where everything's 200 years old. I know. <laughs> And here, oh my God, it's 10 years old. Have they remodeled everything? Have they redone the plumbing? Have they redone the electric? <laughs> oh, no, it's crazy. 
I know. It's like, well, in frame homes. I mean, I grew up in a frame home outside of Chicago and I'm old, you know, and the house is still there. <laughs> I mean, I grew and an amazing and it's frame. You know, Thomas Edison's home is frame and it's and it's still in place. It yeah, it had a few termites here and there. <laughs> but oh, like you said, over a hundred years old. So yeah, I wouldn't I, I I think it's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Very, very good. Um Anybody else have anything they want to share? There, oh, the buyers want a FISBO. Now what? We've had that all up. Yeah. Um, take a look at some of that stuff. Review, you know, if it gets a little bit slower, like in the afternoon when it's raining, pull up one of those YouTubes, take a look at it. Um, make some phone calls to some customers. They're they're at home when it's raining, right? That's the best time to reach them and see if you can start getting some referrals and, and some appointments. And, and kind of go from there. The rest of the world is, you know, having horrible weather and we're having wonderful weather in Florida. So encourage them to come down here. The market is still busy. It's not insane anymore. Thank God. You know, we all need a little bit of a breather, but it, but it's, it's still really, really good. And we just need to remind the world that, that it is, that it is really good here in Florida and encourage them to come down there and that they're not going to be getting raped with pricing, if you will. All right. So with further without it, I'm gonna I'm going to officially hit my little end button on my on my first I opened the Zoom meeting by myself. Yay! Hey. <laughs>